Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get us started here to keep us on track today. Uh, welcome, you guys are attending the Law Careers Alumni Panel today. Um, I would like to start off by letting you know what we promised you and what we um, told you this would be when you signed up. So this event features panelists who are working in various areas of the law industry and they're in various stages of their careers. Um, we're going to lead a discussion here. Again, I would invite you to participate in a discussion and ask questions wherever you see fit so you're getting the most out of it. Um, but it's really going to center around um, how you would attain a career in law, how you um, should approach applying to law school. Um, and this can be approached from a couple of different perspectives. So is this something that you're just exploring? Is it a possible option? Is this definitely the route you're going to take? It's really going to be able to, it's really going to, the, the messaging around it and the things we're going to discuss really work for anybody at any um, stage in the decision making process around pursuing a career in law. And hopefully we can provide you some insight on the law industry, how to enter it, what it's like today, what we think it might be like tomorrow. And uh, to do so, we've brought in a fantastic panel. Um, first of all, my name is Matt Wheeler. I am the Associate Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Arts and Sciences in Maxwell, um, specifically in your undergraduate advising team. So I'm a member of your advising team. Um, as you know, your advisors are both academic advisors and career advisors. And the discussion we're gonna to have today is gonna to talk about both those things, what you should be doing today, now that you're here at Syracuse University to uh, set yourself up for success, and then maybe what those steps are gonna be after graduation or, or what your career might look like once you've uh, graduated. Um, my job is to engage with alumni for the purpose of helping you, uh, our students. Um, I'm not the guy that asks alumni to put their names on buildings or to give donations. I'm the guy who bugs our alumni to talk to you, to provide you with information, networking opportunities, and time. So um, please be sure to be uh, grateful to these fantastic alumni that have joined us today because they are sharing their time and knowledge, which you're going to find is going to be invaluable throughout your career as a student and as a professional. So without further ado, ado I, want to, I want to introduce our first panelist. Uh, the Honorable Brian Burns graduated in 1985 with a policy studies degree. Today, he's a New York State Supreme Court Justice in Cooperstown, New York. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Next up, we have John Jacobs. John graduated in 2008 with a dual major in political science and policy studies. Today, he's an attorney advisor for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives in Washington, D.C. All the fun stuff. <laughs> All your favorite things, right? Thanks, right. Matt. Welcome, Appreciate guys. it. Welcome. And last but certainly not least, Danit Mayor. She graduated in 2018, and she's a triple major. She was a triple major when she was here at Syracuse University. So forensic science, policy studies, and political science. She um, only slept two nights a week when she was at Syracuse. And uh, she today is a 2L law student at American University and a judicial intern for the Superior Court of DC. And I think she gets less sleep now. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Welcome, Denise. So we're gonna launch right into it, guys. Um, my first question, and Denise, I'll start with you since I've got you on the screen. Um, how did you end up deciding that this was what you were gonna do? Like what, where did that even come from to begin with? Yeah, um, I was not traditional. I always knew I wanted to go to law school. Um, my high school offered a pre-law program. So I knew very early that I wanted to do law. Um, I think what changed for me is why I wanted to get into law. And I feel like that constantly evolves. And um, before you get into law school or decide you want to go to law school, it's really important that you solidify why you go, you want to go into law. Um, why I wanted to do it initially was, I, I don't even remember to be quite honest, but now that I'm in law school, um, I, I love no, like the power of knowing the law and how like safe it makes me feel knowing like the procedures and things going on. I always say it's like kind of um, like the matrix. You had no idea like of anything going on. Now you could see everything and you understand what's going on. Um, so yeah. I love that. So not only just like practicing law, but context of what's happening in the world around you. Yeah, exactly. 
that's such an interesting way to look at it. Brian, how about you? Why did you decide to end up in this field? I think the genesis of that uh, was, uh, frankly, the Maxwell School of Citizenship. Um, you know, you read the words on the wall and they talk about not only the rights we have as individuals, but our obligations as citizens to our community. And that resonated with me. Uh, Bill Copeland's, I guess, informal motto, uh, do well in life, but also do good. Uh, that, that struck a chord. And um, after college, uh, I worked for Fidelity Investments for three years and was not fulfilled or content in any way with my professional career choice at that point in time. Uh, and I applied to law school and got in and uh, really enjoyed this as a career. That's fantastic. Where did you go to law school? Suffolk University in Boston, uh, right, right behind the state house. I lived on Beacon Hill. I walked past it every day for three years on the way to Fidelity. And one day just kind of found my way in the front door. I love it. And John, how about you? How did you decide on law? So, uh, so I, I was, I also, uh, Bill Copeland was, was my advisor as well. And one of the things that the judge just said that I, I would say is do, do, do good, do well. Um, this, I felt like law was the, the way you could have your biggest impact, right? Um, uh, or I could have my biggest, one of the biggest impacts was, was actually studying the law. Um, I had been interested in it through high school, but I came to Syracuse and that's why I did the po political science policy studies thing. I did constitutional law and um, I wasn't, I, it was 2008. It was hard uh, to, decide, to determine whether or not you should actually go to law school. I wasn't absolutely sold on the idea. So I, I went out and explored a little bit um, and, and saw that uh, what lawyers do. I, I worked um, for Honeywell as in the defense contracting industry for a while and, and saw what human resources did, what lawyers did, um, and the power they had to change organizations, essentially, or, or make policy in organizations. Uh, so that's why I decided to go back. Now, once I went back, my career path kind of changed, but um, that's why I decided to go back to, to law school and, and, and get my law degree. That's great. So a couple of you have referenced uh, Bill Copeland and your experience on campus with him, but Give us an idea of what, and John, I'll start with you. What, what, what was your undergraduate experience like at Syracuse University? Um, you know, what, what, what did you enjoy about it? What was fun about it? What did you do? For, I guess, what did you do for fun? But also, what did you do that prepared you the most for where you are today? So uh, first, go Orange. I was an avid sports fan. So basketball games, even the football team, when they, I mean, they were Worse than they are now. They were, they had won one game my my I think my my first year and in, in at, at Syracuse. But I I um yeah so I was a I was a big sports fan. I had a good group of friends. But other than that, um, I went in with political science. So I'd taken all the theoretical political science courses. Um, I took some constitutional law. But the thing that resonated with me with both um, what advisors were saying, uh, both both in arts and sciences, and what Bill Copeland was saying was get that and and his program works on is get that uh, real world experience. So whether it's an externship for credit, whether it's one of his classes that have you actually work on, uh, on some policy based stuff, and then in the summer get involved in that too. And that was the biggest impact that, that I had was taking some of those theoretical courses, even, but also taking those courses that required you to, to apply uh, what you're learning, concepts you're work, you're learning, whether it's it, it's it's presenting to class uh, on 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 an issue um, that you learned or a law that you think you can change, you, you should be changed or something like that. Um, uh, or, or I can remember one of the classes I took. They wanted you to present on an issue just five minutes, take any issue, policy issue, and what you could do about it. And mine was medical marijuana. And I, and at, at the time it was kind of early, but it was looking at the impacts of marijuana and, and, and the enforcement of marijuana and everything like that, and where, where things were going and presenting that, but it required you to actually delve into the policy and actually delve into how you would change it or, or should it be changed. And I thought those classes were the best and I'd recommend taking those. So did that shape in any way your decision to go work for the alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosive? No, that, that one, that didn't, I, I my path was was a little different. I knew I wanted to do um, criminal law, kind of government agency work mm -hmm. uh, after I went to law school. And then I was an evening student. So oh. uh, I, I was originally a defense contract in defense contracting, thought I kind of wanted to do the deployment law work and was kind of geared to that. But then when I got to law school, I realized I wanted to I wanted to pivot. 
I, th I thought that was a possibility, but I wanted to pivot. And uh, I started looking for um, full-time jobs with the uh, Department of Justice contractor jobs and was able to get like a paralegal legal assistant job with them. Uh, and that sold me on, on, on where I was going and what I wanted to do. And, and ultimately I became uh, an agency lawyer. I've done some criminal law stuff. So uh, that's, that's kind of what led to alcohol, tobacco, firearms, because I, I just kept taking the next step. I was with the United States Marshal Service for a couple of years, working as a paralegal legal assistant. I saw a job open with ATF and I was like, firearms, interesting, and tobacco, alcohol, interesting. Let me see what that's about. Uh, and then ultimately uh, I jumped in an attorney role there. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I kind of found my way in there. Uh, I knew I wanted to do agency work, but I found my way into, into something I think is extremely interesting. So yeah, no doubt. So Denny, what about you? What was your Syracuse University? You're, you're, you're our panelist who's still in school at a different university. Um, but what was your Syracuse University experience like? Um, I, I was in Greek life. I was in a couple of clubs. I was, I, I was on um, the judicial committee. I think that's what it was called. I don't even remember what it was called anymore. Um, I, I like was involved in um, PAD which is Phi Alpha Delta. I'm pretty sure you guys still have a chapter. It's a pre-law fraternity there too, which was great. Um, my school actually has a chapter now because they have chapters in undergrad and law school. And we get to like meet the Supreme Court justices after we graduate, which is really cool. Um, but I had, I actually had a life and I slept way more than two nights a week. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. I spent a lot of time on Marshall street. Um, I went to the games my sophomore year, actually we made the final four. So that was a lot of fun too. Ooh. I remember like running out of my dorm with no shoes on, which was ridiculous. Um, but, um, kind of to like, I mean, no, I took, I took notes while John is speaking, but like kind of to track back to uh, about like Bill Copeland, it's really funny how like John and I, and I don't know, Judge Burns, if you're familiar with um, Professor Copeland also, but Professor Copeland is the one person who will try his hardest to convince you not to go into law and not be a lawyer. Like that is his thing. He's like, don't go into law school. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, and I feel like he kind of pushed me to do it because he told me not to. <laughs> um, but definitely all the classes we took with professor, the, all the classes in um, the policy studies major were really great because we had a lot of speakers. And whenever we had these speakers, I would walk up to them at the end and I'd be like, hey, I was wondering if your organization had any like internship opportunities or if you could connect me with someone. Can I like can I um, send my resume to someone? And that's how I got in undergrad, my internship for the district attorney. Um, and I interned there for two semesters, one semester at, in the special victims um, unit. And then the other semester I worked in the DUI unit, which was also amazing. Um, but definitely take advantage of like, you guys are doing it right now, but take advantage of like when alumni come to speak or when people come to speak, you really need to take advantage of the op these opportunities because law especially is the type of field where it really matters who you know and the connections you make because it's a very, very small community. And people always say that. And I didn't really understand until I got into law school and everyone's like, oh, you know this person, you know that person. Um, so it's really important to maintain those connections and even establish connections. Um, and that's one way that I did it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how small industries can be? Like you come across the same people over and over again. And I think that's one of the things that we try to reinforce when we're doing networking trainings and things like that is like, no, you have to at least make a semi-positive impression with this person because you can't make a negative one because you never know when you're going to be, um, when, you, when you're going to be relying on that person. Maybe they're going to be on a hiring committee. Maybe there's someone who can pass a resume off for you. Maybe then internship opportunities. It really does get small quickly um, when you're out there, especially if you want to work in the same city as somebody, same industry, and then you're a Syracuse University grad on top of that. So you share that with them. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really important. So I want to hit on that point. You, you took an opportunity not only to attend a session with an alum, but then you approached the alum afterward. What, I mean, so, so, and that opened up opportunities for you, but, but what did that, what did that take? How did you, was that, was that something you've always been comfortable with or was that something you kind of had to gear yourself up for? Yeah. Um, so 
the class, I don't remember what class it was, but every week we had a different speaker come in. Um, and I saw that the district attorney was coming. I'm like, wow, like this is a great opportunity. He works in law. Like, this is what I want to do. Like, like maybe I could get a potential, like I, and I looked to see if like any internships were offered in his organization. And I did my research um, prior to him coming to the school to speak. Um, and it was a very, it was a very small um, speaking event. I think there was maybe like 20 people who went. So after he gave his whole spiel and told us about like what he did and how he got to where he got at the end, I went up to him and I said, Hey, like, I really enjoyed your, um, the discussion. Like, thank you so much for coming here. I was wondering if you um, had any internship opportunities or if you could please connect me with someone who um, would know the answer to this because he was the district attorney. I'm, I didn't expect him to know everything going on all, at all right. times. Um, so, and then he told me, shoot me an email, I'll connect you with the guy who um, is in charge of the internship program. And to this day, me and Barry Weiss <laughs> yeah. are still very good friends. I actually connected a Syracuse um, undergrad student with him also recently. So that was really nice too. It's <laughs> and amazing. Syracuse alumni love to pay it forward. Um, always, we definitely have that connection. So take advantage of us. <laughs> yeah, and it could be, it could be scary, or it could be just one extra thing for you to say, okay, I'm going to walk up to the front of the classroom and introduce myself here. But you see how simple and a simple interaction like that can really lead to great things. So um, yeah. I think it's a fantastic example for our current students. Matt, I would just say I, I would, uh, I, I agree with the need. I, I, that I, in school, I was, a, I was one of those people that was kind of reserved and I'd have to push myself to go. I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't as, as, uh, as, as willing to do it after alumni events. I did go to them. I listened to them. I had some classes where they spoke and I will say my recommendation to any student out there is every one of the alumni are human beings, no matter what position they're in, mm -hmm. uh, anyone that they bring in to speak, they're here for a reason. They're here to help you. So do not be afraid to, to go up and talk to them. Do not be afraid to do your research beforehand. That was one of my failures. I think in, in, in school, uh, was I probably didn't take advantage of those alumni as much and approach them afterwards and talk to them about their careers. Um, but so I would encourage you to do that though. Uh, don't be afraid of them. Um, they were in the same position you're in uh, at some point. I was in the same position you guys were in thinking about law school, not thinking about law school, not sure what I wanted to do uh, back and forth or sure about law school at some points in my career. So take advantage of that. Um, I, you're going to probably have my information. Feel free to reach out to me. That's fine. I but just take advantage of it. So thank you, John. Right here. Cause I absolutely love that point. I see so many students who are either questioning or not sure and um, we have the great privilege of working with students even whenever they become alumni. And so looking at things and seeing them as opportunities and Judge Burns, I am curious about your undergraduate experience at Syracuse University. And I really appreciate you sharing about how after your undergraduate experience, finding that law was for you. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to characterize my undergraduate experience as a time of personal growth and maturity, uh, but the reality is I was having a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> my freshman year, I was on the crew team. I played JV lacrosse for a couple of years. I was in a fraternity. I took advantage of all the athletics uh, in terms of the basketball, college basketball and you know SU hoops. Um, I, I had a lot of fun and I was a... Um, uh, not terribly interested student. Um, I mean, I had solid grades. I graduated with a, like a 3-2 GPA, but um, I didn't, that was somewhere far down my list of priorities. Um, and in hindsight, I'm, I, don't, I don't really regret that. Uh, I, I say jokingly, it was a time of personal growth and maturity, and it really was. Um, I mean, I could have spent four years in the library studying and gotten much better grades, but not have been anywhere near prepared for what came after college had I done that. Um, and, and, I want, I, and I hope the students that are on the call understand that. You have to be solid. You have to go to class. You have to do the work, but you don't have to make it the be all and end all of your college experience. I would encourage you not to get stressed out if you get a B instead of an A, it's okay. Um, you know, again, you have to stay solid, but uh, at least in my law school in Boston, 
they had a saying, you know, the best lawyers were the B students because they weren't the ones who just sat in the library 12 hours a day, but didn't know how to talk to people or relate to people. And as a lawyer, you have to be able to communicate uh, and you have to be able to relate to people and understand what their issues are and concerns are and be able to empathize with them and, and really try to serve their interests. Uh, and you don't learn those skills by sitting in the bottom of the library for 12 hours a day. Um, I, I did want to comment briefly on the, the networking that we've been talking about. I agree completely that that is important, but unless you have a solid foundation underneath that to rely on, then all the networking in the world is not going to get you anywhere. Networking maybe opens a door and gets you an interview, but if you don't have the goods during the interview, if you don't have the, the experience and the demonstrated ability to be dedicated in your studies and to do well, then who you know doesn't matter. Uh, it, it still matters a lot what you know. Uh, and you know, as someone who's approached uh, for internships and things like that almost every day, uh, I will tell you that it's very easy to tell who has done the work and who hasn't and who's just reaching out and creating, you know, a thousand people on their LinkedIn page. And, but there's no substance underneath that. So, so don't forget about the substance. That's, that's what really matters. Uh, and if you don't know anybody and you are a reserved person and you find that it difficult to do those things, that's okay too. I, um, after I graduated from law school, moved back to central New York, which is where I'm from. I didn't know anybody uh, where I moved back. I moved back to a small community where my wife was from. Uh, I got a part-time job as an assistant district attorney, worked my butt off. Uh, within four years, I was the acting district attorney. And I still didn't really know any of the power players. Three years after that, um, a judge passed away. The governor, um, who <laughs> I have no pull with, I've never met. Uh, reached out to my local state senator. I never even went to one of his fundraisers, uh, but they tapped me for a, a, an appointment by the governor uh, to fill that judge's uh, term. Uh, I, I had to run at the end of that term. Uh, I've been elected to two 10-year terms. I'm now in a, a 14, my third 14-year term, um, but I didn't know anybody when I started. Um, but I think I had the substance. So while the, the networking is important and it can open doors, you have to have done the work so that when that door is open and they say, okay, so who are you? Tell me about yourself. What have you done? You can answer those questions honestly. I think that's a fantastic advice around networking. That preparation is something that sometimes I do see students forget about, um, Judge Burns, because I think sometimes it's, um, you know, a great example is I'll have students come to me and they'll say, well, I've talked to this person at this company because I want to work there, um, but I haven't submitted an application. I, I, and and, I, and I, my, my advice is always, well, how do you, what do you expect them to do? You know what I mean? They're not, they, they, you can expect people to, 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 to help you out, but you've got to, you've got to put some work in, like for in that example, put the application in so you can say, hey, there's an application in for this position I'd like to be able to uh, attain then the person can walk down to their HR office and say, hey, this is a Syracuse University student, had a good conversation with them, check out their resume. There's something for, there's an action for them to take that's reasonable. I don't think it's reasonable to expect someone to walk down to HR and start advocating for you if they, there's not even a resume in there. Or, you know, like there's the, the way that networking happens is it's often a small, a small gesture. Uh, and Denise, in your example, where you have someone who you walked up to and he said, just email me. And he probably passed that email. Uh, uh, Mr. Weiss probably passed that email on to somebody else and then it got rolling, you know? So there's networking is sometimes these incremental little things that you need to accept. And, and, and it's not always going to be, sometimes it gets oversold as if you just talk to this person, they'll hook you up. And that's not really how it works. The preparation is key and understand that small little connections can help you in a big way. Uh, Judge Burns, I wanted to stay with you because you were the first person to bring up Bill Copeland, and now he's come up a bunch of times in the conversation. What is it about his philosophy and his approach that um, made you feel particularly prepared to go out there into the world? 
I think it was just the substance of what he was saying. It wasn't so much his approach, uh, you know, with his unique brand on it or, or anything else. Mm -hmm. it, again, it was really the substance of what he was saying um, that struck a chord with me. Uh, I love that. How about John? How about you? What, what, what stands out for you about the way that uh, Professor Copeland teaches? Uh, I, I think what I liked, uh, and I'll go back to what I liked about, about the policy studies major is I, I, you know, I have political science. I would have a lot of, um, my more theoretical courses. Um, and then I would go over to policy studies and get kind of practical and, and, uh -huh. and that's what I liked. Um, practical. And, and yeah, pra just the, the practical expertise. And that's what I liked about the policy studies major. And I think he's done a good job offering those types of classes. Uh, and I thought it was a complimentary of, of, of my political science degree. So that's, that's why I did that. Um, I think uh, in those classes itself, I, I think what it's more of a practical thing than like a, a educational thing. Uh, it's 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 more in practice what you should do is one of the things that I remember him kind of saying at one point. I mean, it wasn't some profound statement, but just that you need to become the expert in what you're doing. And that's what I would recommend to anybody that goes out there is is when you go out and find your 40 hour a week job and you start working 40 plus hours a week and you're, you're like, you're miserable because all of a sudden now you just started working 40 hours a week. It's a major change because before you had an eight o'clock class and that's when you started class on, on Friday, not Friday or, or Thursday, Thursday before, before you went out with your friends, right? Um, when you're back in the 40 hour week and you're, and you're I, would, I would stay patient, but also find something that no one else wants to do or knows how to do and become that go-to person for that issue. And, and it may suck at first. It may, it may be hard to wrap your head around a research project or, or find a new, new process in order it to implement to make things easier. It may, it may not be good, but people will look at it, be impressed. And then two, you become the expert in it. And then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're you know, Matt Wheeler, the, the, the new uh, employee looked at this and go ask him, you know, I mean, like, so mm -hmm. whatever it is, find that, find that area. I remember when, when I first started, uh, one of the things was I, I worked as a government contractor. I was more on the admin side, administrative side of things, um, where we would deploy people, get prepared to deploy people to put boots on the ground in Afghanistan. And we had an entire process of getting their medical clearance, getting their background check clearance, getting all of these things done. And I helped put a process together where it was easier to monitor that, where it was, uh, when I first started, where it was easier to have a, a spreadsheet or a database to pull that up. Uh, it started with a spreadsheet and then went to a database and, and it made it much easier, but I contributed to that. And I was on a team that did that. So we became the experts in that. And that, that's, that's important. Um, I think, I, I think Copeland kind of instilled that in us. It was like, become the expert in your policy when you're selecting a policy you want to change or, or, and become the expert in something you're doing, even how, how small it is, because you become, um, I, I guess, you're not expendable then, right? And you're the go-to person, so. Yeah, go-to person for that specific issue, but also the competencies and the skills that you build to accomplish that, people very quickly see, oh, he could, he could handle this then also. This is something right. else I know this person could handle. Exactly, exactly. So I've always tried to do that wherever I've been. So perfect. Danine, how about you? You took classes with Bill, right? Yeah, I love that man. But um, <laughs> so it's really funny. So most people who know that they want to go to law school, they traditionally major in uh, uh, poli sci, which is like, OK, like I need to major in poli sci because I know I need to go to law school. So this is what I'm going to do. So I naturally picked classes that would satisfy the political science major. Um, one of which was um, PATH 101. I don't know if it's like different, but it's the introduction class. Uh, it's Bill Copeland's class. That is his class. On um, the first day of class, he like takes someone's ID and like cuts it up. And like, I was terrified of this man. I'm like, I am so terrified of this man. Like, I love him. Like, I need to continue. Like, I need to, I need to major in whatever he's teaching because like, he is a harsh critic. And like, I thrive off of, critical feedback because that's, I know that I function best when I have something to improve. Um, and he's the type of professor who like pushes you and like makes you think differently. And one thing that he always said that like stuck, that stuck with me 
um, was um, the first key, to, the first step to solving a problem is identifying a problem. And like, I just like always like thought about that always. And like, even still in like law school, the, the like substance of the classes, like it's very like applicable to like the, the way you think in law school and how you deal with things in law school. And I'm like so grateful for, for having the opportunity to major in, uh, um, sorry, in um, policy studies because I was able to like have to build all these skills. He like emphasizes skills all the time, skills, skills building. And it's so true. Um, but yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. And I think what's it was, I love the critical thinking. I think that's key. I think that's, a, that's such an important skill that he, he really instills in people and that practical experience and those experiences outside of just opening up a book and learning what's in there and memorizing or, or keeping track. Not that other professors don't also contribute these things, but I think, I think um, time and time again, his name comes up because of those things, that level of engagement that he inspires, but also his approach that I think is, is really um, rooted in the real world and, and, and how you approach problems and identifying problems, I think is a great example. So thank you for sharing that experience. Uh, students, if you have any questions at any point here, you are welcome to type them into the chat or just turn off your, um, or just turn on your camera rather, and uh, feel free to jump in at any point. We'd be happy to do that. But if you'd like to just type it in the chat, that's great. I'll open us up for questions here in about 15 minutes, but we're happy to incorporate you at any point. So feel free to join in. Um, same thing with uh, Rachel and Laura. Do you guys have any questions for the panel? Yeah, uh, something that was just coming up for me as you all were talking is it's really cool to hear about like your time at Syracuse University and the things that started inspiring you toward law. Um, what keeps you there? What, what keeps you on this journey? And I'll start, let's start with Judge Burns. I'm keep going to you. <laughs> uh, about well, 20 years ago, uh, I was a superior criminal court judge and a family court judge, a multi-hatter, they called me. And um, it had become very clear, I think, societally, that the way our criminal justice system was responding to those who suffer from substance use disorders was just dysfunctional. Uh, you can't cure someone who has a substance use disorder and addiction by telling them, stop using drugs, stop drinking. We're gonna put you in jail and that'll teach you a lesson. And then they're gonna, they're gonna be all fine when they get out. Um, of course, they're not. The first thing that someone under those circumstances does when they get out uh, is go celebrate their release from jail. Uh, and that leads to more drinking and more drug using, which leads to more criminality, which leads to more arrest, more prosecution. And we're in this endless cycle uh, where nothing productive is being done. Uh, I had the opportunity um, to create a drug treatment court, which was a diversion uh, diverted, uh, that is, those with substance use disorders who were committing nonviolent crimes or parents who were being neglectful, not willfully, not, not because they're malicious people, uh, but they're engaging in negative conduct as a result of their substance use disorders. And we're able to create two special courts uh, to divert those types of individuals out of the criminal justice system, uh, away from a punitive response uh, and create a treatment program for them. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've had literally hundreds and hundreds of people who have successfully changed their lives, gotten kids back from foster care, uh, been able to get and keep good jobs, become contributing members of the community. Um, it's been one of the most rewarding things that I have done uh, I serve on the New York State Association of Treatment Court Professionals Board of Directors. You know, so you, you give out to others in doing things like that, but it also gives you a sense of professional fulfillment. And, and sometimes you just get goodies. It's like good karma. You do good things. Uh, 2018, uh, I received a Fulbright Award from the United States State Department to go teach about this at a law school in Ireland. Um, that's not something I ever would have been able to do or even <laughs> thought of doing. Um, but it's, it's those types of opportunities to really make a difference in your community uh, and in society generally that keep me interested and involved. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, sometimes you get unexpectedly happy, positive returns from doing things like that. But um, you know, one of the memories I have that will always stay with me, uh, a mom who, single mother, two kids, long-term victim of domestic violence had turned to substance use to try to um, deal, deal with her situation. Uh, and it was the last court session before Christmas. She'd been working hard for a year to get the kids back. She came before the bench. I said, congratulations, you're a year clean today. You've got a job, you've obtained and maintained stable housing. Would you, when would you like to get your kids back? And she said, I'd like to get them back as soon as I could. And we had set it up ahead of time. Uh, so the foster mom brought the kids in the back of the courtroom and she get, we were able to return the children to her that day. Uh, and they wow. had uh, a great holiday. Um, so it's, it's those type of moments that keep me actively involved. So that is an, an amazing example of, of law doing some really, some real good. And I think like, at least, I think if you think of law, typically the first thing that comes to mind are, you know, maybe <coughs> lost, lost law TV shows, or, <laughs> uh, you know, I got to go pay this ticket for my, pay my parking ticket or whatever else. The, so do more, do opportunities like that typically, how, how much of those, how many of those opportunities exist out there where you're able to really do things like what you did with those programs or to stand up those additional options for people um, to do real good out in the world? How much of that is um, accessible for students who are moving into law? As much as they want. Uh, the law is such a broad, flexible, uh, the legal profession is so broad, so flexible. Uh, you can, th there are no limits. Uh, there's no limits to the opportunities to do good for your community if you become an attorney. That's fantastic. So what would you say, and, and John, I'm gonna jump back over to you. Maybe this isn't fair to, to, to pin it on any one person. So anybody can jump in on this one, but <laughs> what, 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 what challenges have you faced? Like we all know, like, you know, you hear about law school. It's like, oh, it's so incredibly difficult and um, get ready, um, you know? So I think that's something that weighs heavily on students who even if they're decided on law, weren't gonna go into it. But like, what challenges have you faced? What, you know, failures have you overcome? Like, has the road just been completely simple for you? Like. <laughs> What has your experience been like when you, when you think of when someone comes to you like law school? Geez, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I want to say Judge Burns gave me chills with his story, and I would completely I completely agree with him. The opportunity to do well and do good for your for community is out there when you become a lawyer in a variety of different ways, not just uh, his sense, um, but of a, a, a variety of different ways, whether it's in D.C. or, or local communities in uh, upstate New York. Um, my challenge, my challenge was uh, was probably unique in that I went to evening law school, and it was hard. It was it was is not easy. It was I thought I made the mistake uh, because <laughs> because it was a lot of work. Um, you know, we had you know you work all day and then you have class all night and then you go home. Uh, and I got married during that time, which was, wow. which was not a mistake. I don't want to, I don't want to be, that was the best thing that ever happened to me, but also maybe I should have waited till after law school, <laughs> but yes. Um, what so was your was, job was, at the time? What my job was, I worked for Honeywell. Um, I was a staffing specialist there and then I jumped into a security compliance role. Okay. Uh, so I, you know, I was working a full time 40 hour a week in Columbia, Maryland and going to school at Columbus school of law. So it was very difficult. It was in, in DC. So it was very difficult. Um, I think that was probably my biggest challenge um, was, was getting organized. And then, uh, you know what, at some point I was worried about my grades and, and to judge Berg's point, but I didn't necessarily have time to be in the library all the time mm -hmm. at, on the, on the bottom floor, uh, sticking my head in a book. Uh, so I, I just, you know, did the best I could uh, with, with the situation I, I was given. And, um, you know, did well, but I think the big thing was, you know, I, I, I did the work. I, I got through law school. I, you know, um, A's or B's just get through law school and get that degree. 
uh, and keep doing what I'm doing and put a plan in place. And my, the, what helped me was I, I realized I didn't want to do employment law. And I said, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to either, one of them was possibly go back full time and, and take advantage of that, which I'm glad I didn't do that in hindsight. The other was find a job in criminal law and find a job in government uh, and work full time with the gov- with the government or in a contract role. And I was able to do that. It took a long time, a lot of failures and in interviews, a lot of, uh, a lot of interviews, you know, to Judge Burns' point, always go prepared, know what you want, know what your background is. A lot of interviews. I'll be honest, I, I, I was that person that went and walked in and I wasn't ready. Uh, and it, it took, it took a, a, a lot for me, for me to get ready and to, to, to kind of go outside my shell and be ready for those interviews and, and finally land that job. Um, and, and that's, that's where, where I, I, I could see my, my career path went that way, right? Uh, it, it went the right way. So. Yeah. Danique, so triple major right into law school. Law school must be easy for you, right? Oh, totally. <laughs> um, I actually, so one of the best decisions I did, I think, was taking off in between law school and um, after I graduated in between. Like, I highly, highly, highly recommend that. I use that time to study, uh, to study for the LSAT um, and also intern. Um, but I only expected to take one year off and like study for the LSAT, get it done, apply to law school. And like, in my head, I was like, I'm going to get like a 180 on the LSAT. Like I'm going to go to Harvard. I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to be the best. Like I need to go to a good law school because if I don't go to a good law school, then I won't get a good job. And then my parents will kill me. And then like my life will just spiral out of control. Like there's like a lot of like anxiety and a lot like resting like on your head that you're just constantly thinking about. And um, I feel like I struggled a lot with that, especially since like my friends were all working and I was like in this limbo because like everyone knew that I wanted to go to law school and I was gonna be a lawyer because I made that very clear to everyone. This is what I wanted to do. And everyone's like, oh, it's like, when are you going to law school? Like, when are you going to law school? Have you taken the LSAT? It's like, no, like I'm freaking out about it. Stop asking me, like, let me, let me do my thing. Um, So that is something that I definitely struggled with. Um, And then in my mind too, after I got into American, American is a great school, but like in my mind, I was like, I'm gonna transfer and I'm gonna go to like Harvard again, because in my mind, that was like my idea, which is like just totally wrong. Like just go to a law school. Like that's a big thing. Like go to a law school that has professors that are teaching things that you're interested in, has opportunities that you're interested in. Like my law school has like amazing like clinics where you can do good, um, just like Judge Burns was saying, where you could like work for with people in the community and like do amazing things. Um, so that is definitely like I struggled with with that, but also um, just looking at everyone around me just moving while I was just stagnant. That really, really like, and even still now, like I'm in law school, all my friends are like making money and like doing jobs, and I'm like sitting here like in debt, like studying, miserable all the time. Like that's why law school is really hard because everyone around you is just moving and you're just there just trying to be done with it already. But it is the traumatic experience that um, bonds our profession, so. (laughs) That's great. How how about you, Judge Burns? I mean, you are a New York State Supreme Court justice, so it must have been just smooth smooth the whole way there, right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's a unique experience having to run for, in New York, uh, we're elected uh, mm-hmm. to run for an office when you can't tell anyone how you would decide a case on a certain issue or um, how you would rule on things. And uh, it's, yeah, that's, that's a unique experience. For me, the biggest challenge has been um, ch- trying to strike the proper uh, balance between my profession and my personal life. Um, as a young prosecutor, uh, I had a double homicide trial. And, you know, I just, I, I didn't see my wife or my young children for two weeks uh, because all I was doing was preparing. Uh, and you never feel like you've done enough, that you can be prepared enough for, for a case like that. And, um, you know, I, I realized that that's not something I wanted to do. And I had to find, that, that is not seeing my wife or my kids. I had to find a, a balance between that. And that's a constant struggle. 
because you always feel like there's one more thing you could do. Uh, today, when I write a decision, you know, I, I, my, my secretary puts first draft on top, second draft, and then as you know, the 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 big red pen gets bolder and bigger out after my like my fifth draft. I'm like, I can make this a little better if I just work on it a little bit longer. But at some point, you have to say, okay, it's time. It's time to go home. It's time to, you know, go go play with your kids, go to their games, do those types of things. If you don't find that balance, you become miserable, you burn out, and you're both a lousy spouse or parent and a lousy attorney because you're just unhappy. Um, so uh, it's, uh, to me, that's always been the biggest challenge um, is, is trying to find that proper balance. We have a couple answers coming in now, or a couple questions, I should say, and I'll put them out there. Whoever wants to jump in on them, uh, feel free. Um, but the first one comes in and uh, from Praise Johnson, it says, uh, what personality traits are important for going into law? Um, and more specifically, how would they know if it's a good fit for them? I could jump in. Um, kind of going off what uh, Judge Burns was saying, you need to really know when to set boundaries because otherwise you're going to be consumed and you're going to have no, like by work, by stress, you're, you really need to know how to set boundaries. You need to be responsible. You need to know how to manage your time. Um, there isn't like, I would say like a type of personality that like is a perfect fit for a lawyer because like you could be a litigator and be like out like in court litigating and like presenting things in public speaking or you could do corporate work and you could be drafting contracts and like sitting behind a desk or you could work in politics like there's so many different types of areas of law and like I don't think I really knew that um, until I went into law school and saw like, wow, like being a lawyer isn't just being a lawyer. Like there are so many different types of lawyers. Like you could do like intellectual property, like you could do, you could do criminal defense, you could do like healthcare law, you could do like there's so many different types of law. Um, and I feel like there's a perfect fit for anyone, um, no matter the personality. I just think that you really need to want it and you really need to be able to push yourself and motivate yourself because no one's going to be there motivating you. So you got to really push yourself. <laughs> Great. Praise had another question for us as well. What? Matt, Matt, I'm sorry, Matt. Can I jump in real quick? Yes, please do. On the personality trait, the one thing that I see over and over again that leads to the most successful students and lawyers uh, in terms of their personality people that have a curiosity about them, that are intellectually curious, people that enjoy learning, um, people that, you know, if they're researching a legal issue and they're reading cases and they come across a point that has nothing to do with what they're researching, but they find it interesting and they don't mind, instead of a linear straight line, research kind of taking an hour to go sideways and just learn about something that has nothing to do with what their assignment is, but. I just want to know what this is. I want to know how that works. I want to know why a judge did that. Without that sense of curiosity and enjoyment of learning, uh, being a lawyer is not the right profession because you will be learning constantly throughout your entire career. John, how about you? Any particular uh, personality traits? Uh, well, I, I would say I would say the learning thing it, uh, that Judge Burns just hit on is key. Like, I, I, one of the best things I love about my job is I. I have no, 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 uh, and I think most lawyers would say that you don't have the same question every day. Um, you're always kind of on your toes trying to, trying to answer questions. It may be similar, but you're going to have to go a different way. And I love that. I love that aspect. I love new things. I love learning new things. I, I think that's important is, is knowing that uh, you're, you're willing, you're working diligently on something and you're going to get interrupted. You don't mind being interrupted by, by something that comes comes to hit you in the side of the face and you were ready to go learn about that. Uh, that's, you have to be eager to, to go learn about that. I also would say generally um, to make it easier on yourself. And this is, this is just a, you need to have attention to detail. You, you need to you not only be willing to learn, but you need to have attention to detail in your reading and your writing. Uh, in order to just succeed. And I know those are really practical, but and but you can work on them. Um, if you're not that detail-oriented now, you can work on your writing. I worked on my writing. 
I, 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 I worked on that and I worked on, um, you know, my teaching and getting to, to, to the specific thing I'm trying to teach or my oral communication. So you can work on that thing, that stuff, but attention to detail is key in all of your communications and all of your reading. Fantastic. Marcus has submitted a question too, so I'm going to jump to his really quick. And if we have time, I'll jump back to your other question phrase. Um, Marcus is interested in knowing what kind of positions are most valuable for those with little experience. So maybe like entry level, like what are those first careers maybe out of law school or maybe even pre-law school that would be, um, would set people up for success as they continue in their career in law? I, I'll jump in, but I think in undergrad and prior to law school, you just, the best way to go about um, getting some experience is like, just, just get yourself out there and work something in something in the legal field. It doesn't matter what, just get in there so that you understand how it works and what you're setting yourself up for. For. because most legal internships are are aimed at law students and I remember really really struggling to find legal internships because there aren't many places that offer legal internships for undergraduate students so when you get your hands in an opportunity um or when there's like an, an opportunity that is open for undergraduate students definitely take advantage of it it doesn't I won't say that like, oh, working for the DA's office is like the best, like that's what you need to have on your resume. Like I work for the Division of Human Rights in, in Syracuse also. And that was like, I got so much like legal writing experience and I didn't even know what legal writing was at the time. You don't learn legal writing until like you're in law school. And now my supervisor here was teaching me like, this is how you have to go about writing something. And that was really valuable to me. You just really need to, be, it, be, make yourself, give yourself the opportunity to ex explore the field. That's essentially like what your mind needs to be right now. Treat it as a game of like process of elimination. Um, so like, I still don't know exactly like what I want to do. So I'm trying to, to like, try like, oh, let's try like family law. Let's see if I could get something in family law. Let's try something in immigration law. Let's see if we could do something there. And like, I learned that I absolutely hate family law. I absolutely hate immigration law. There's no way I'm going to go into that. So definitely not that. Onwards and upwards. What can I, what can I pick next? What area of the law can I explore next? But um, yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> that's great, Brian or John. Did you have an answer for maybe where a student should start with experience? Maybe it's internship or job earlier in their career. Well, just, I mean, from, from my perspective, the position that's most valuable for those with little experience, judicial internship. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy to get, but in terms of the value, uh, you get to see the judicial system, the justice system from the inside. Uh, and from uh, someone uh, who's achieved some level of success and can say, this is how things are actually done. This is how they should be done. Uh, and uh, when you're done with your judicial internship, uh, when you go to apply for a job that, uh, or, or a position uh, uh, as a student in a law school, um, I think that's incredibly valuable. But again, I'm a judge, so of course I'm going to say that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if I was, uh, if I I was John, you. I would say you have to work for the ATF. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would say I, I would say along the same lines is, is anything entry level that that involves um, that involves the law, uh, the, the internship level. What I did was I was a, I, I had an internship with the Brooklyn DA's office for just uh, early case assessment. And just basically when they came in, I I would just look at cases and then and, and uh, kind of they had a charge sheet. And you look at the charge sheet, very simple stuff, but it, it got my experience in that. And then I also had experience in the. Uh, um, when I went to Hong Kong, I worked for just a month with with Lovell's uh, law firm out there, and they just had me do kind of admin intellectual property stuff for them. So that was a good experience. So anything, uh, even if it's a short time, um, anything, anything you can get that uh, is in the law field uh, early, um, that's fine. And for me, I was a paralegal legal assistant, which a lot of times they don't transition. Uh, don't, nobody transitions into a lawyer, but that's what that's what I did while I while I was working in law school, and that's how how I got into uh, ATF. So um, I, I, they're they're few and far between, but they are out there. 
they are out there and you can find them, so. Great advice. So back to Praise's other question, what aspects of that law school application are gonna be most important? Is it, is it GPA, is it the LSAT score? Is it these internships, you know, what, where, I, I think in terms of prioritization, probably probably all of the above. But um, what what do you think is um, what do you think the schools are looking at most? I'll set. I'll set. I'll set. <laughs> it depends where you go to school. So yeah. some schools, it's all LSAT and GPA. You know, if you don't have a three nine or above, or you know, a one seventy four or above on the LSAT, it's it's not an option. Um, but, but the one thing that I've seen that's kind of more generally applicable to most law schools and, and also continues on to when you're in law school to be successful and then being a lawyer, most important thing from my perspective is being a good writer. Most applicants for law schools are dedicated students who have worked hard, who have decent or really good GPAs, who have decent or really good LSAT scores, um, who have done some internships, who have done those types of things. But the ones who can communicate that the best through their personal statement uh, are the ones who stand out. When you're in law school, you know, nine out of 10 kids are going to be intelligent. They're not kids, young men and women. They're going to be intelligent. They're going to have demonstrated a dedication, intellectual uh, success, academic success. So they're all going to be working equally hard. And they're all going to have, by the end of the year, more or less the same knowledge basis, who can, commu can communicate that best to their professors through their written exam are the ones who stand out and get the best grades. Quite often, the, the lawyers who stand out are the ones who can communicate with their clients in an effective way, with their courts in a persuasive way. Uh, and so much of that still is written communication. So uh, to me, uh, the best advice I can give, and I know we're about out of time, so I'll end with this, is take a writing class if you have the opportunity. Syracuse has wonderful writing programs. Um, learn to be a really good writer. Uh, I, I, just, I just got uh, a letter from an attorney who said the case settled and all the documents we submitted, and I think they meant to say are no longer pertinent or no longer relevant, but the word impertinent means kind of disrespectful with a little connotation of mischievousness or a little sassiness. Oh, that's an impertinent answer. That doesn't mean not pertinent. I, that, but the lawyer said my, my prior filings are impertinent. And I had to write back saying, I'll take the case off the trial calendar because I guess you settled, but I don't understand why you're telling me you have sassy answers in the paper. <laughs> Be a good writer. I mean, that lawyer stands out, but frankly, as a dumbass, not as somebody that I'm going to remember for their good communication skills. So that's just so important to me. And thank you for having me as part of this panel. Thank you, Judge Burns. Yeah, um, next time you're sitting in that writing class, don't ever wonder, why, why, why do I need to take this? Because in, in law and all other areas, it's crucial. So uh, we are at our time, so I, I have to respect our, our alumni's time. I appreciate you joining us so much. As you can see, these conversations always go places that are unexpected and more valuable than we could even uh, anticipate. So thank you so much for your time and knowledge here today. Denny, John, Brian, it was amazing. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, students, um, experiences like this are happening all the time at Syracuse University. Um, as you can see, and as you've heard today, there's a lot of opportunities for you to get to know alumni and learn from them. And then as you get to network with them and form relationships with, with them, they can benefit you in your internship searches, your knowledge, your law school applications, all these things. So definitely take advantage of that. The best way to do that is through a program that we run in the, in the, in the college, which is called our uh, Alumni Connections Program. I'm dropping a link to that in the chat right now. Um, under the header of Illuminate Your Career Path with the Help of Alumni, there is a program that you can sign up for in which you will connect directly with, a, with alumni, one-on-one -on -one conversations. You could have a conversation just like this with actually any one of these three alumni and more. So please take advantage of that. We'll get you all prepared. Don't worry about that. We'll give you networking training so you feel, um, feel prepared and don't bring any anxiety to the table. We understand how you might. 
but we'll give you those skills. So take advantage of it. Because as you can see, the alumni really are eager to give back and they have so much invaluable knowledge to be able to share with you that you really are going to be able to um, uh, feel a little bit better about that law school application, feel a little bit better about that path and maybe have somebody new in your corner to support you along the way. So panel again, thank you so much. We'll wrap it up there and we hope to see you again soon in the future. Go Q, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Matt. Nice to meet you, Judge Burns and Denise. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Have a great day, all.